Well, I am a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. From the very beginning of my career and training as a psychiatrist, I was interested in understanding how we think from both a brain perspective and a cognitive or subjective experience perspective. So even when I was in medical school, I, I took a wonderful elective small course from Oliver Sacks. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a quite well-known neurologist writer about trying to connect the brain with and brain function and brain abnormalities with deep aspects of human experience. I also spent six months in London during medical school and studied at Honor Freud Psychiatry Clinic. And then I also studied at the Institute of Neurology, which is the probably the, the leading historically neurology center in the world. And I thought these two things are hard to put together thinking about us in terms of our brains and thinking about us in terms of our cognition, our subjective experience. So the best thing to do is for me to learn about both these things fully and deeply as a believer and a student in both and see what happens if both of these sets of knowledge are in my brain and mind for 35 years and see what sort of understandings you know might evolve from that. So then, um, you know, people are, have focused a lot uh, scientists, brain scientists, neuroscientists, and trying to understand brain function by studying single cells or studying two cells together. And when they study two cells together, they look at the synapse. How does the message get transferred to one or the other? And they think about those in chemical terms. And then a lot of our interventions for treatment then become drugs that are going to alter that chemistry there. Now, when they study single cells function, they study single cells in mice and rats, and they assume that the function of the single cell in a, mi a mouse or a rat's brain is very similar to the function of a single cell in the human brain, and I agree with that. But if the single cells are the same, how come our brains function so much differently and that we have all these capacities that you know, rats and mice don't have? It's not because of a single cell. It's because of the number of cells we have in our brain and the ways they're interconnected. So it was clear to me that these neural networks involving hundreds of thousands or millions of cells distributed all through the brain are the basis of our emotions, our thinking, our memory, our attention. Not any single cell, not some lo single location in the brain, and not what goes on just in the chemistry between the two cells, but in these big networks. Next question is, what creates the connections between the cells that make these big networks? And the critical answer is that it's not determined by genetics. The connections between the cells that create the networks responsible for what we consider human functions are created after birth by stimulation from the environment. So then there becomes an interesting question about the environment. Humans are the only animals that change the environment that changes their brains. Sure. Rants, uh, uh, ants make nests, you know, beavers make dams, that's about it. But look around here, humans are raised almost exclusively now, at least in our part of the world, in human-made environments. And consider the electronic digital environment that our children are raised in. You know, it's totally human fabrication. It's not what nature uh, was like when humans were evolving 100,000 years ago. So we, we call this cultural evolution. The fact that the brains literally structure as well as function are shaped after birth by stimulation from the environment and we as a group, a community, create the environment that creates our brains. It creates these neural networks, shapes the structure and function of our brains. Now, it doesn't mean genetics have no influence. Sure but the environment has a huge influence, and it can be for good or it can be for bad. So a number of us started about 15 years ago seeing if we could harness this brain's neuroplastic potential to address problems. I started first with cognitive problems in people with psychiatric illness. How can we, because we had no medications that could help that. So can we target an under-functioning brain system present tasks that require that brain system to be active, make the tasks easy enough so the person can do them 
even though that brain capacity is limited, monitor how well they're doing them with modern technology, incrementally making it harder as they get better, just like going to the gym and adding a little bit more weight, a little more weight when you're trying to improve that leg right. function, and produce what we call activity-dependent enhancement of targeted under-functioning brain systems. So yes, the answer is we can. So then about six years ago, I said, why not apply this to actively developing brains of young children and use the technologies uh, that we had developed for web-based, computer-presented, cognitive training games, try cognitive training exercises disguised to look like computer games. And um, then as I looked into it a little bit more, it became even more interesting. There are three cognitive operations three cognitive skills, attention, self-control, and memory, that predict learning ability, math and reading scores, more powerfully than IQ. We call those executive functions. There's a suite of cognitive operations. Teachers aren't surprised. We have a quote from a teacher that says, we are, I'm expected to get kids to learn all this content material, but they can't sit still in their seats, they don't pay attention to what I'm saying, and they don't remember what they have, I'm trying to teach them. Attention, self-control, memory, more powerful predictors in IQ of academic achievement. Another body of research says that poverty compromises exactly these cognitive skills. So kids raised in impoverished environments don't get the type of stimulation, whether it be talking from their parents, reading by their parents, uh, educational toys, taken to educational, like the wonderful museum, children's museum in Indianapolis, they don't go there. They don't get that stimulation. They get bad stimulation, some of them exposed to trauma. They get exposed to lead. They get exposed to secondhand smoke. They don't necessarily get the, the best nutrition and sleep. They come to school without having developed these cognitive functions essential for learning through no fault of their own, they're put in a situation where demands are made of them that they're not neurocognitively prepared to meet. And it sets off this deviant developmental trajectory, poor self-esteem by the student, the child, doesn't like going to school. And we can show, it's a great point, we can show, uh, not me, other scientists have shown, comparing activation in the parts of the brain connected to attention and language, they compared at nine months of age children from poverty and children from affluence. By nine months of age, the children from poverty, brain development was lagging behind exactly in the areas that they need for function school, attention and language. So, so from a neuroscientist point of view, I saw this as a, a pretty straight shot. We know that these cognitive skills predict academic, academic outcome. We know they're compromised by poverty. So we're going to intervene and improve those cognitive skills. We're going to harness the brain's neuroplastic potential, activity-dependent enhancement by designing these cognitive or brain exercises, have the kids do them, and promote development. I call it a school lunch program for the brain. We give kids who don't get enough food to eat, but can come to school, enough nutrition, they grow faster and catch up to their growth potential. We're giving the brain of these children stimulation that it didn't get before in an intensive, focused way. And it works. So we have shown that those three cognitive skills are improved and that it translates into better performance on the standardized proficiency exams. And Evansville is a pretty remarkable school district. I've got to say that. Um, you have a, a, a director of neuroeducation. I haven't found that anywhere else in the country. So that's Susan Phelps. So she knows about the importance of understanding brain function and development to understanding learning and brought our program to your school. Now the other dimension of our program is physical exercises. Now physical exercise is just good for people. It improves brain or increases brain neuroplasticity. But we took it a step further. We designed physical exercises to do in the classroom that involve cognitive function. They involve attention, self-control, and memory. So we're engaging these same brain systems that we engage in the computer exercise. We're engaging when the kids do physical exercise, but now in the context of whole body activity and social interaction, they're exercising these same neural circuits that support these essential cognitive skills. 
And we've made it into a series of exercises, a curriculum, progressive series that gets more and more challenging as the kids get better and can be adapted for different ages to do in the classroom, three to five minutes during the day, no special equipment, no having to go to the gym classes, which un unfortunately don't exist in many school schedules anymore. And so that's our program. Uh, that's why I'm here today. I'm here to train a new batch of teachers. That's it. We understand wh what the problem is so we can address it. And we also, another key element, we measure the problem. You can't measure something, you're a little bit lost. You can't see whether what you're doing is working, you don't know how bad the problem is. So we built in research quality tests of attention, self-control, and memory automatically administered in the classroom setting where the kids have to learn. To get tests like this, frankly, honestly, for a, neuro, a private neuropsychologist, costs $3,000 per child. Rarely do schools get them, and if they do, they do it once. And you're planning whole, several years of education on a one-time assessment. They're essentially free with our program. And we actually do the assessments not in a private office, in quiet setting, one-on-one -on -one with an adult, but in the classroom where the kids have to learn. So that's the other thing, is to be able to measure is very important. But it is complicated and difficult for schools to be adaptive and, you have a, uh, and to adopt new things. And you have a leadership here that's committed to that. And I just was learning about it earlier today with, in a nice meeting with your superintendent. And, uh, you have a really systematic, comprehensive, multidimensional approach to preparing kids to have the learning skills and life skills that they need to live in the world and also at the same time to succeed in school. There are, you're not alone in that. There are some other schools like that. There's so many problems facing schools in this country and teachers are reluctant to give up any curricular time because they think kids aren't doing well in math and reading. We gotta give them more math and reading. We say to them, you can't pour water into a jar when the lid's closed. Right. You keep trying to pour, there you say you're not learning math, what are you doing? We're giving them more math. They're not learning reading, we're gonna give more reading. No, you gotta give them the cognitive skills to open the lids so the content goes in. I think we're about to see a sea change, uh, partly driven by the fact that what's happening is not working for large numbers of our kids, and partly driven by the fact that we have evidence that ours works, and the neuroscience understanding of why, and the technology to deliver at low cost on large scale to kids around the country.